House Speaker Kevin McCarthy says he wants to work on bringing House Republicans back together after the conservative Freedom Caucus sharply criticized his debt ceiling deal. But after the concessions McCarthy made to get the gavel, can he keep those members who criticized the debt vote from trying to remove him as speaker? Here with me now is a member of the Freedom Caucus, Congressman Ken Buck of Colorado. Thank you so much for joining me this morning. You, I want to make clear you don't vote to raise the debt limit. So you just certainly didn't vote on this deal. But I want to ask you about it in the context of the Freedom Caucus. You called the deal atrocious, and yet it passed by almost 200 votes, including a majority of Republicans. President Biden, I should say, signed the law yesterday. What does this say about the power of your colleagues in the Freedom Caucus at this moment? Well, first, Dan, if I may, I wanted to uh, correct something that uh, Jamie Raskin said earlier, my colleague from Maryland. Um, there is no uh, MAGA group in the House that wants to uh, make sure that we default. That, 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 that's just a, a talking point that is unfair. Uh, there are a lot of people in the House uh, and a lot of representatives in the House Freedom Caucus who want to make sure that we don't spend more money than we have and that we don't uh, spend ourselves uh, into a really bad situation. But I think the, the House Freedom Caucus, uh, with a five vote majority in the House, still retains a lot of uh, influence in the House. The, the key is that we use that influence in a way that uh, brings conservative results. And I think that's what we tried to do with this case. And we failed, uh, honestly. The, the Speaker got Democrats uh, to vote for this bill. Uh, because the bill is, and in fact, more Democrats voted for this bill than Republicans. This bill is a Democrat bill. It is a bill that not only avoided a default, but also locked in the progressive gains that the president made in the last two years. You said that Speaker McCarthy should be concerned about a motion to vacate. That's when one member can force a vote on whether to remove him from the speakership. Is that going to happen? I don't know if a motion to vacate is going to happen right away. Um, I do know that uh, Speaker McCarthy has credibility issues. He promised when he was running for Speaker that we would use the 2022 baseline numbers as the appropriation numbers uh, for this year, um, and then went back on that promise with uh, this particular legislation where he promised uh, and, and signed into law the 2023 numbers. So uh, the, we, we continue to see the swamp the folks in Washington, D.C. who want to spend more money winning, and we continue to see the folks who want to spend less money and, and really act responsibly uh, losing. And so I think that, that uh, Kevin McCarthy has an issue in a broader sense. Well, what's going to determine whether you and uh, some of your colleagues will actually use the tool, motion to vacate, effectively trying to push him out? Well, I don't think it can be used by just a few people. I think there has to be a, a consensus in, in the conference, Republican conference. And I think there has to be um, a uh, uh, really a I, I, I applaud uh, Kevin McCarthy for saying he wants to bring people back together again. Let's see if he does that in a way that uh, involves spending uh, responsibly in, in the future, because that's really what a lot of us uh, have to see if he's going to regain credibility. Well, he doesn't seem all that concerned about a motion to vacate. I want you to listen to what he said. Look, everybody has the ability to do what they want. But if you think I'm going to wake up in the morning and be ever worried about that, it doesn't bother me. If someone thinks they have, right, they have the right to do it, call the motion. He did show strength. Uh, a majority of the House Republican Conference did vote for the deal. You just told me that. It, it wouldn't happen unless there was consensus in the conference. Based on the vote, you're not going to get that. He's, he's going to stay where he is because he's uh, claiming victory. Well, a lot of people voted for this because they have other interests that Kevin McCarthy has assured them uh, of. But, but that doesn't mean that they are satisfied with his leadership. And it doesn't mean that they're happy about the fact that they had to vote for this. Um, uh, Nancy Pelosi, in her uh, years and years of, of being speaker, never once uh, asked Republicans to vote for the rule, the a procedural uh, mechanism that puts the bill on the floor. Uh, Kevin McCarthy, in his first five months, had to ask the Democrats and received 52 votes from the Democrats to actually have the bill heard. 
Um, that's, that's really uh, unheard of and, and shows weakness. And I think that's the sort of weakness that Republicans are looking at and trying to make a determination whether he will be fit to serve. Just, just, just one more question on this. The other side of that coin is being able to get Democrats to vote on a procedural measure that Democrats almost never vote on could be seen as a sign of strength that he is a, a, the speaker who is a constitutional uh, role for the entire House, not just for the conservative caucus. Sure, it, it could be considered a, a sign of strength uh, to those who are outside uh, the U.S. House. When, when you are uh, forced to get Democrats to vote on a bill that locks in President Biden's progressive agenda and huge spending increases, which have resulted in inflation, which have resulted in really damage to our economy, um, you're not strong in, in, in the view of Republicans. I want to turn to a different topic, and that is CNN reporting that federal prosecutors obtained an audio recording of former President Trump talking about holding on to a classified document about a potential U.S. At attack on Iran that was after he left office. You're an elected official. You know that it is illegal to take classified documents. And the tape appears to show that he knew he had those documents. Do you find what President Trump did, the former president, irresponsible? Uh, well, as a former prosecutor for 25 years, I think it goes uh, beyond just irresponsible. It's a, it's, I, I don't know if, if uh, anybody has located the document or there's a copy of the document somewhere that, that can show just what kind of... Uh, uh, information um, and, and classification uh, that that document had. And I don't know if anybody saw the document. I know that he uh, was waving some paper, but I don't know if anybody saw a document with a, uh, a stamp on it. Um, it wouldn't be the first time that, that President Trump has talked about uh, things, um, and, and he may have been uh, mm -hmm. illustrating uh, something. But uh, it depends on what the testimony is as to how uh, severe this is for his criminal case. If it is found or if they can prove it at DOJ based on your years as a prosecutor, did he break the law and should he be charged with a crime? Well, uh, I, again, I, I am not going to second guess uh, the, the prosecutors at DOJ. I work there. I have a huge amount of respect for them, and I'm sure they'll do the right thing. But I, I, uh, without knowing, without seeing the witnesses, without examining the documents, uh, it would be irresponsible for me to Got suggest it. that... Uh, he should be prosecuted or should not. You have acknowledged more broadly that Donald Trump is facing some ethical challenges in his campaign. In addition to what we're talking about, the classified documents probe, he's under investigation for election interference in Georgia uh, for January 6th. He's already been indicted in New York. Would Republicans be better off with a candidate who is not facing multiple criminal investigations? You know, it's interesting. I think that uh, the multiple investigations and civil lawsuits that have been brought uh, almost give this presidential candidate and, and former president credibility. He keeps saying that the world is against him because he's trying to make these changes. But does he and, give and all of does these he give actions him that are being taken? Sorry, forgive me, but does, you said give. I, I know what you're saying. He gives him credibility with the, maybe with some in the electorate. But for you, Ken Buck, does he give him credibility to you? Well, I, I have seen him for four years. I was in the House when he was president. Uh, I voted on his bills. I voted against his bills, uh, sometimes his budgets and, and whatnot. Uh, so I have seen him personally. I don't uh, look at the uh, actions that he has taken um, uh, that, that are being investigated as much as his, his role as a former president and, and what okay. his policies were. One last question. You attended an event for Florida Governor Ron DeSantis here in Washington in April. You sat next to him on the House Judiciary Committee when he was in the House. What do you think of his campaign so far? Do you have advice for him? Yeah, I, I uh, actually uh, mentioned to him uh, when we uh, talked at that event in Washington, D.C., uh, my advice is not to try to out-Trump Donald Trump. Uh, there is nobody that is uh, really that operates in the same area as Donald Trump. And I think Ron DeSantis has a strong record of accomplishment in Florida uh, a, a, when he was dealing with COVID and, and some other areas. And I think those are the things that he should be running on. I have not endorsed uh, Ron DeSantis and I would uh, go to events for uh, Nikki Haley or mm -hmm. uh, Tim Scott or others uh, who are friends. Um, but I do think that, that he, Ron, should do his very best to, to run on his strong record as governor. 
Ken Buck, uh, thank you so much. Appreciate you coming on this morning. Thank you.